to do that what we do is first of all and we are not very far away from the end of this class today. I do not want to introduce too many concepts in the same day especially as we are have another class tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a class at 5.45 pm same place right. First of all let us introduce the concept of function space and let us go back to that refrain please do not get scared. Function, function space is no rocket science it is not very difficult to understand it at our level it is fine. So, what we mean by function space is just a collection of functions let us put it that way. Do not think of it a space where you can sit down and have your biscuit and all collection of functions ok f 1, f 2, f 3 etc. so on and so forth ok. And an example of function space is a collection of say the position vectors p 1, p 2, where is p 3, p 3, p 4 are the colors showing up? I do not see them very well Achha. and what we have done is we have drawn these fun these position vectors in three dimensional space x, y, z and the unit vectors the base vectors are e 1, e 2, e 3 as usual right handed uh, Cartesian system is that right? Is the right handed axis system or not the way I have drawn it x, y, z right handed or left handed? The days of left handedness are over better be right handed ok. Uh, even position vector uh, is an example, position vectors are examples of functions. So, uh, see position vector is something that is easy to understand right because it is in tangible space. So, I have used them as an example that is all ok these are examples this is not the general picture. So, it is a collection of functions now they have to satisfy certain uh, properties then only can you call that collection function space. What are the properties? First of all f i plus f j equal to f k you add up any two functions you get another function another function in the sense another function in the same collection. Now, think of any two position vectors say p 2 and p 352 add them up what do you get vector addition you get another vector where will the origin of that vector be? at the origin origin I am talking origin where will it begin origin of vector will still be 0 0 0 right. So, that vector will also be a function uh, that vector will also be a position vector right. So, this is satisfied by position vectors f i plus f j equal to f k got it fine. What are we trying to do here? We are going to define something that is completely abstract a function space can be anything right then we are going to define an operator by now everybody is familiar with the use of operators on vectors right eigenvalue equation and so on and so forth. So, that is the approach we are going to take we are going to make an operator operate on these functions and then see what comes out and what will come out is going to be a perfectly general picture which we can use for any system that we want right. So, the thing is we started with symmetry we talked about matrices today we came back to symmetry and we have established a little uh, some connection between what we discussed in the first three classes and in the next three classes today now we are seemingly making a little bit of departure once again but it's not really a departure it is just that we are defining the same problem of symmetry which is tangible in a little more abstract term okay and the reason why we need an abstract definition here is that we need generality. So, in case uh, I lose you anywhere please do not hesitate to stop me and we will go back a little and come back, but it is important that we understand fine. Second point n f m equal to f n does it work? Does it work for position vectors? It works just multiply by a scalar you still get a position vector to make uh, things more convenient the direction of this position vector is the same as the position vector that you started with all right. 
just multiplication by a number scalar okay. Third is a combination of first and second a linear combination of the projection vectors sorry a linear combination of the functions is also a function that I think you can understand easily take a linear combination of any number of position vectors what you get once again is a position vector okay multiply each vector by whatever number you want does not matter what is the definition of a position vector must begin at origin can point in any direction right can be of any length so no problem right. So position vectors so far are falling in line with the definition of function space that we have defined great. Next this is what we perhaps know what is f1 comma fi comma f fj in bracket yes what is that called another word the scalar product the scalar product right. So the scalar product is defined as integral fi star fi d tau integrated over all space okay that sounds scary I am scared whenever I see an integral right. I get extremely scared when I get a when I see an integral printing mistake I hope the printing mistake has not continued later on also I hope I did not delete something. Yeah, all right. So, this is the definition. Let us see what it means. Whenever I get scared by the integral sign, I remind myself that an integral is just a summation, then I am a little less scared. Because even my 7 year old son can add, okay. Addition when you say addition, it is not all that scary. When you say integration, I at least I get scared, right. So, let us see. Let us take an example once again of two position vectors and let us see what the scalar product means and let us uh, as we will see it will turn out to be an addition of the same form okay p i p j. So, printing mistake has not continued p i p j equal to p i p j cos theta right j is just a subscript p j means j th p not the usual meaning this is a pj pi pj equal to pi pj cos theta right so let us work it work this out for the position vectors to help you i'll write this pi equal to xi e1 plus yi e1 e2 plus zi e3 and pj is equal to xj e1 plus yj e2 plus zj e3 e1, e2, e3 are the base vectors, unit vectors along x, y and z directions respectively. Now if you take the uh, product what do you get xi, xj, e1, e1 what is the dot product of e1 and e1 1 what is the next term xi, e1, yj, e2 so xi, y1, e1, e2 what is that dot product? 0 right cos theta is 90 right. So, this is what you get very simple x i x j plus y i y j plus z i z j okay. So, that is somewhat like a sum well that is a sum that is a sum of products this is also a sum of products right fine. Next one is a little unusual in this course generally we do not have paragraphs we only have bullet points this is a paragraph and what we are saying here is something that you know very well it is just that I have said it in many words. If n of the functions are linearly independent what is the meaning of linearly independent what is the meaning of linear independence yes yes go ahead. exactly you cannot write any vector 
any of the linearly independent vectors as a combination of the other ones. So, the formal definition is this linear independence means sum over i a i f i has to uh, no sorry sum over i a i f i equal to 0 if and only if sum over i a i is equal to 0. all these are 0 a 1 a 2 a 3 a 4 everything is 0 this second sum is not right. If all the a i's are 0 that is a trivial solution otherwise you cannot write sum over i a i f i equal to 0. Let us take the easiest example that we understand take x y and z can you write something into x plus something into y plus something into z equal to 0 can you write how something into x plus something into y plus something into z do not forget what it means something into x plus something into y plus something into z is a position vector right. When will the position vector be 0? When the coefficient of x is 0, coefficient of y is 0, coefficient of z is 0 right trivial solution. Otherwise the point is this you have x, y and z take x and y okay if they have a non zero resultant it, it will be in the x y plane right that means what it will be perpendicular to uh, z axis right. So, vector sum of something in x y plane and something along z can never be equal to 0 is that right. Something in the x y plane and a vector a vector in the x y plane and a vector along z no matter what the angle is right this is the angle never be equal to 0 that vector sum will never be equal to 0 or in other words if you transpose that is what I think uh, Shantanu was saying you cannot write something like z equal to a x plus b y unless everything is equal to 0 ok this sum is not right that is just again. So, you understand what I mean by linear independence. So, let us go back to this definition now. If n of the functions are linearly independent, then any of the other functions can be represented as a linear combinations of these n functions. Very easy to understand once again in terms of position vectors and base vectors. Any position vector, think of any position vector, you always write it as x i e 1 plus y i e 2 plus z i e 3 ok the components any position vector right that is basically what we are saying here. If n of the functions are linearly independent in real space we have three functions that are linearly independent right then any of the other functions can be represented as a linear combination of these n functions. Okay. In other words what we say is that we say that the space is n dimensional the space here is 3 dimensional. Okay. So, just because you have many vectors many functions suppose you have 480 functions it does not mean that we are working with 480 dimensional space what you have to see is that how many of these vectors are n dimensional uh, are linearly independent. Okay, that number will give the dimensionality. How many position vectors are there? Three position vectors only. Infinite number of position vectors are there. So, are we in infinite dimension space? No, we are only in three dimensional space because three vectors are sufficient, right? A linear sum of these three vectors is sufficient to describe any position vector that you can think of. So, this is the meaning of dimensionality not how many vectors there are, but how many of these vectors are actually linearly independent all right fine. And then when these are orthonormal then it this forms what is called an orthonormal basis function right. There are many examples of orthonormal basis function x y z is a little boring 
you have said so many times. Can you think of another example being chemists? Think of another, uh, let us keep it simple. Think of another three dimensional basis function. You are chemists, do not forget, and this is a physical chemistry class Px, Py, Pz. Px, Py, Pz, right. Now, let, now let me ask uh, one of my favorite questions What is the magnetic quantum number of Px orbital? Okay, uh, people who are taking eight to one course now do not answer. And I think it has it would have been discussed. People who took eight to six last semester also do not answer. Others and we have definitely do not answer. Huh. Yeah. What is the magnetic quantum number of Px? Plus one or minus one? Or minus one? What do you, what do you mean either plus one or minus one? Depends on Mm -hmm. Pz is 0, I agree. What about Px and Py? What is the magnetic quantum number? Both? You are taking, you are studying 8 to 1. Huh? So, <laughs> wait, let us see if the others figure out. 103, CH 103, 107, whatever you studied. Or CH four to five. What is the phi part of m equal to plus one orbital wave function? What is the phi part? A theta and here above phi. Theta is theta and phi is phi, and never that way shall meet. E to the power of, uh, uh, m equal to plus 1, what is the uh, theta phi dependent part of the wave function? E raised to i phi and uh, for minus 1, e to the power minus i phi. So, is e to the power i phi along x or y? It is out of this world, it is in the imaginary axis, right? Px or Py do not have well defined magnetic quantum numbers. Okay. This is discussed in Atkins physical chemistry book among other places. The point is this, these are imaginary wave functions. Okay. If you define magnetic quantum number only when m equal to 0, what happens is you get something in cos theta. Cos theta is along z, right. What is theta? I hope you have not forgotten. This is theta, right. Starting from z, this angle is theta can go from 0 to 180 degree. What is phi? This is phi along x y can go from 0 to 360 and r of course, everybody knows what r is. Now, so if this is theta, this angle, then cos theta would be along z, right. So, when m equal to 0, the e to the power i 0, what is that? e to the power i 0 is 1, right. So, that imaginary part vanishes. So, you get a real orbital and that real orbital since it has something in cos theta, it is aligned with z axis. That is why it is called P z. So, for P z m equal to 0, right. But for m equal to plus 1 or m equal to minus 1, you cannot draw them along P x or P y. So, what you can do is you can take linear combinations, right. You add ones and subtract once and in one case divide by i, then you get functions that are along x and along y. Just read it from Atkins uh, book to, uh, this evening, right. So, m is not even defined. So, the reason why I invoke all this is this that m equal to plus 1, m equal to 0, m equal to minus 1, right. They form an orthonormal basis set and p x, p y, p z they form another orthonormal basis, understand. And are these uh, two bases 
completely divorced from each other? No, they even have a common member in this case, but you can generate these real wave functions as, uh, by taking linear combinations, appropriate linear combinations of the imaginary wave functions. So, basis can be interconverted, transformation of basis is not impossible, it is doable, it, it is done, right. So, this is the meaning of orthonormal basis function, right. Second last slide, what we, so now I, I hope we have at least some idea of what uh, basis functions are, right, what a function space is. So, we are going to take that function space and we are going to make some operator operate on that function space. What is our goal? What is our goal? Why are we doing all this? To get an A at the end of the semester, but other than that? Yes, to get, uh, to get let us say without being a spoil sport, let us say uh, we want to develop a uh, generalized method, right, of knowing how many reducible representations there are, what are their dimensionalities and what they are, okay. That of course will come from great orthogonality theorem, yes. And they are interconvertible also. You take linear combinations, this uh, plus 1, 0, minus 1 can become x, y, z. Similarly, you could have taken the 5 d orbitals. d orbitals is what is worked out in Bishop's book. I want to leave that for now because I want to handle d orbitals after mid sem when we talk about inorganic complexes. d orbitals are also fascinating. Do you know why dz square orbital is called dz square orbital or dxy is called dxy or dyz is called dyz? there is a better uh, way of putting it, okay. So, we will come to that just, of course, this question is uh, when I was in school, we had this O. Henry story, I think everybody has read this, some guy wanted to get into jail because it was winter. So, he broke a window, the police did not catch him, he did a lot of things. Finally, he wanted to get reformed and he got caught. So, that word cop was used there. And uh, we had a question, why is a cop called a cop? Do you know why a cop is called a cop by the way? It is actually a good question. Somebody wrote uh, some other question, a cop because uh, policemen used to wear copper helmets, it's cop from copper. <laughs> that is why a cop is called a cop. So, similarly, we will learn why dxy is called dxy, dz square is called dz square. We will also learn that dz square is only a nickname. Most of us have nicknames and good names, right. So, dz square is not a good name, dz square is only, only a nickname, we will learn what the good name is, but that is for another day. For now, what we are trying to do is, we have defined the basis, now we want to define transformation operators and today we will stop at just the definition, we will not go any further because then nothing will transform, okay. So, what we basically want to do is this. We want to write transformation operators for every symmetry operation and this is what is going to happen when you make the operators operate. Or f i in the transformed coordinate system x 1 dash x 2 dash x 3 dash is a transformed coordinate system. So, the transformed function in the transformed coordinate system is going to be the same as the original function in the original coordinate system. Does that make sense? Coordinate system, not base vectors. See, you move this point. So, it has become something else. But now, if you move the coordinate system along with it, same, exactly same uh, transformation, then in the, so, there can be two kinds of coordinate systems, right. One is uh, the uh, rotating or uh, let us not say rotating, molecule fixed or center of gravity uh, fixed uh, reference frame, the other is space fixed coordinate system. One can be absolute and the other can be along with the molecule. Of course, my left hand right hands will never meet again. So, you can transform the coordinates with respect to each other, right. 
So what we are saying is that uh, you, you studied NMR spectroscopy, right? Huh? In NMR spectroscopy, have you studied this rotating frame of reference? Rotating frame of reference. Uh, okay, let us take an even easier, simpler example. Have you seen record player? In ancient times, people used to uh, listen to music from records, which are like big, huge CDs. It's just that they are black, right? So you see a record player. I mean, the record is like a CD. So when a record player is in action, what happens? You see that the record rotates. Okay? Have you seen uh, this movie, Honey? I Shrunk the Kids. Everybody has seen that movie. Suppose somebody shrunk you and you hopped on to the uh, record, would you see it rotating anymore? Of course, the more tangible uh, example is that do we feel that the earth is moving? We do not because we are on the earth, but if we uh, stand somewhere outside, then we will see the earth moving. right? So that is the point. We do not perceive the change in earth because the earth is rotating, we are rotating along with it. So the transformed us in the transformed earth coordinate right, is the same as the original us in the original earth coordinate. That is all I am trying to say. Okay. Does this make sense now? ORFI in the transformed coordinate system is the same as the original FI in the original coordinate system. Where is A? F k, okay. I k these are just you know, arbitrary letters, these are designators. Right now we are in this line, have you understood that line? Then we go to the next story. Next story is what we had written earlier. Okay. Suppose you are working with a function space made of n linearly independent basis functions. Here I should have written f k actually, I have written f j and f j, no, 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 f j is fine for this fj is fine. So suppose you are working in a function space where you have n linearly independent basis functions. Okay. You have already uh, seen a relationship like this, right? we had written it earlier e dashed, what is e dashed, e1 dashed, e1 dashed is nothing but or e1, transformed basis vector and here see we are talking about linearly independent basis functions like your e1, e2, e3. So, we just write that earlier equation in a different form. On the left hand side, we have OR FK, where FK is a particular uh, function chosen from these n number of linearly independent basis functions. That clear? K is a particular function, maybe the 186th function, K equal to 186, let us say. Okay. So, that OR FK that means the transformed coordinate, transformed kth coordinate will be sum over j and here I have got it right, sum over j equal to 1 to n, d j k r, what is d j k r? r corresponds to the symmetry operation, d j k is the j, j k th matrix element of the transformation matrix corresponding to r and do not forget I write d j k here because I have constructed the D matrix using transformation of the coordinates, not the basis, right? That multiplied by Fj summed over j equal to 1 to n. So this is more or less what we had written earlier also when we had talked about that uh, C3 operation example, right? Isn't it? Here, e k dashed instead of e k dashed, we are writing o r f k. That is the only difference. When you make o r operate on f k, you get this, right? That equal to sum over j d j k e j. All we have done is that we have specified r a little in a little more explicit manner. Make sense? I think we will stop here and we come back tomorrow and we start from here. What we will see is that 
these are these turn out to be what are called unitary operators back to unitary and then we will need to know two more things what is what are equivalent representations what are unitary representations. Once we have done this then we are ready to derive what are called Schur's lemma. Schur is uh, some European surname S C H U R Schur's lemma and from there we are going to arrive at rate orthogonality theorem. So, I think uh, by next Wednesday at least we should be there if not on Tuesday definitely on Wednesday we will have derived rate orthogonality theorem and then in Friday's class what we do is using rate orthogonality theorem we start deriving the character tables. After that uh, let us see I am in two minds we either will talk very quickly about vibration I am a little reluctant to do that because it is discussed in CH442 or we will just get into uh, what we did last year in this course talk about what is called symmetry adapted linear combinations and discuss valence bond and molecular vital theories. Okay. Uh, please I am going to send this uh, right away this presentation please go through it once before you come tomorrow it is only tomorrow right not very far away. Please go through this so that we are ready to take this uh, tomorrow. Thank you.